We're a Kiwi couple living in Australia who brought a 57-foot steel trawler after she sunk in a flood and was pulled from the sea. We're now bringing her back to life. We're on to the finishing jobs after working on her for the last six years to refit and get her ready for launch as soon as possible. Brewpeg is rebuilt by us with volunteers funded by Patreons and viewers and we spend every cent we have to make sure that she's ready. She's fueled by veggie oil, diesel, solar and wind power to do research, projects and expeditions to remote places like Antarctica and the Northwest Passage. She'll be crewed by supporters from around the world. Welcome aboard. We're taking you for a little walk. Come with us. We thought we'd show you some different types of stabilizers. We get some kind of reoccurring comments that we thought would be a good way to sort of clarify some of the things like, you know, why do stabilizers, why do the type that we've got and things like that. There's been almost panic in the, <laughs> in the comment section this week. Some of them have been awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks guys for commenting, yeah. it's really good. And I can understand the concern because they're, yeah. you know, if you're not used to being around these kind of boats and this kind of system, it's, it, it's confusing and, yeah. and anxiety provoking. We're here to calm you down. <laughs> we've got an opportunity to show you a boat that has active stabilizers as well as one that has a wing motor. So this is something that's commonly brought up on the channel around going to Antarctica. This is a Nordhaven, a really well-known like ocean-going design. And these guys use active stabilization. As you can see, an active stabilizer is much smaller than our wings. <laughs> Alright, that's not true. That's actually the stabilizer there. So <laughs> it's the same shape as ours, look, aerodynamic. Yeah, so the way that they work, essentially you've got a post, this is the pivot point here. And it works like a rudder, so it can turn like that. So as you're steaming, this is the front. As you're steaming through the water, this is flapping left to right, left to right, and basically counteracting any rolling movement on the boat. Um, they're awesome when you're steaming, but because they're physically quite small, they don't do a lot when you're anchored. So you need a secondary type of stabilization generally when you're anchored. And the other downside of using active stabilization is you have to run a generator either to produce electricity to rotate them or to produce hydraulics to rotate them. So there's a fuel burn trade-off that you have to make with active stabilization. Pivot point is here, you've got this big metal plate, the pivot point's here. This is just a protection to stop anything getting caught in between the two and, the, and it will rotate left to right um, in this orientation here, down, sort of sticking down however far they go. One other thing that's often mentioned about going to Antarctica is redundancy. People say, why don't you put a wing motor on the boat? This is a wing motor. So you've got your main prop with your main engine and everything connected to it. And then you have a completely separate and independent motor and propeller. Normally it's a folding propeller like this one here. And so there's a mechanism in the end that allows those blades to fold right up. The downside of a wing motor like this is it's incredibly exposed and it's a thin prop. So imagine that going through ice. That's the first thing that's gonna get ripped off. And then you've got a gaping hole in the side of your boat. So that's why we absolutely won't be doing a wing motor. But also commercial boats like Brewpeg um, have single main engines. That's really, really common. So they're much more reliable than, you'll, than the motors you'll see in like recreational boats. And that's why we're comfortable doing that. This is an active stabiliser in position. So you can sort of see it's offset at the moment, rotated one direction. If I come right around the front, you can sort of see looking down the length of the boat, it's tilted off to one side. And that's how they work going through the sea. They basically rock back and forth. This is the first time we've had a boat next to us where we can actually like use the space in between. Normally you've got to keep your, all your gear off the other person's space, but we're sharing, so it's so nice. And of course the tarp's up for the heat for working on the stabiliser at the moment. This episode we're working on getting these sides of the boats welded in. So you can see we've got some new plates of steel um, into the side. We've already done our handrail at the top. We've got the lip going just below that where the sliders run and then filling in the side of the boat where we've got this new steel. You can see we've blasted it and we're about to weld it in. So why stabilizers at all? Um, if you're not used to this, it can feel like a really odd thing to be putting on the side of a boat, and particularly this big, like it's a big stabilizer. And that's because we need our boat to be very strong and stable no matter what we are in. Because we're going to remote places in the world with a bunch of people, we need to be safe. And um, this is also gonna double as a place to jump into the water. We're going to have uh, cameras underneath, so we're going to be able to orientate our cameras to get some amazing footage of wildlife under the boat. So we thought we might explain why we put stabilizers on the side of Brewpeg, why it's so big, and also we had some comments, uh, some confusions and ideas and even disagreements um, about 
how we've designed it, how big it is and all of that. So we thought we'd talk about that with you. So it's not just a random idea that we came up with and thought we'd try. <laughs> it's in collaboration with an amazingly experienced fisherman um, who's designed many of them for 25 years um, and they've been tested in the wild <laughs> on trawlers uh, down the southern uh, part of Australia in Victoria. Uh, and Chris got in touch with us and helped us clarify some of the design things that we needed to know about. So hence that's why it is the way it is. It's been tried and tested, but some of the details we thought we'd go over with you. Regarding the size of the wings, um, they're big on purpose. The reason being is it's easy to cut some wing off and actually make them less efficient than it is to add more on and make them more efficient. So these wings are designed so that everything from here out can be basically trimmed off um, if the wings prove to be too effective. So that's why I'm not worried about them being big at the moment. They are big for brew peg. Um, however, we've also built them knowing that we can cut some off. Another question and a personal favourite of mine is will they rip off and kill everybody? Um, the short answer is no, but I'll put some more detail behind that. I do love that <laughs> comment. <laughs> One of my favourites. So this big plate of steel, this rusty here, this is called a doubler, and this is welded basically straight to the side of the boat. The boat's made out of 6mm mild steel, this is made out of 25mm uh, mild steel, so it's an incredibly stiff and solid part of the boat. The other side of it, this beam that runs along here, this, this round section here. Called the chine? It's called the chine and it's one of the strongest parts of the boat because you've got that rigid sort of corner on the boat. Not only that, halfway along about here somewhere is the main bulkhead between the engine room and the freezer room. So it's an incredibly stiff part of the boat and the doubler is made long enough so that it intersects a rib um, on either side at, at each end. So this is probably the strongest part of the boat. Like it's, it's almost difficult to make this any stronger. The only way you could do that is by really putting in extra tanks and things on the inside. Now, when they retrofit a boat with these wings, like a commercial fishing boat gets a set of wings, they don't do a doubler, they don't do any of this. They literally weld the um, hinges straight onto the side of the boat. They last at sea and it passes commercial survey. We've gone way above and beyond. Our hinges are massively oversized. Normally they use a 32 mil pin, we're using 55 mil. Um, normally they uh, have three little hinges. We've got two hinges, but we've got really big, solid, gusseted, um, high tensile stainless hinges. And we have this massive doubler that intersects the bulkhead as well as the two ribs. So yes. will they rip off? Not a chance. We are going to be upgrading the, the hinges. Chris talked about piano hinges are the best because you can get them really up close. Stainless pin through hollow bar. That's, that'll be mild steel. Um, and that'll stop any galling up if it's if the if the pin and the and the hollow bar are both stainless, it'll gall up. So they've discovered that that doesn't work. Of course, stainless is brittle in the sense that it can just suddenly get a, a fracture or a crack and can give out. Whereas mild steel is kind of. Um, <laughs> if you can think about it as more pliable, it gives you notice when it's wearing out, so nothing dramatic happens fast, or well not, not usually, so much better idea. Another common question is why use a cable and why have a pulley on the wing here mounted in this orientation? So first thing, the pulley has to be mounted in that orientation because obviously that's the way that the cable needs it when it goes up and down, and these cables here, they, they start, they move around like this as the wing goes through its full travel. You can't physically mount it that way unless you put a hinge type arrangement which just introduces a weak point or something that can break. So doing it this way is the simplest, strongest and easiest method that we can come up with. Um, in terms of drag, it really doesn't matter. On a boat of this size, having a little panel sideways like that, you're never even going to notice it. You've got a great big flat panel here and here. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's not an issue. In terms of using cables to lift rather than something like say Dyneema um, or chain um, is another common suggestion. Cables are, are universal when it comes to trawlers. Their nets are basically hauled up and down with mild steel cables, galvanised mild steel cables like this, and they just cover them in grease and they last a long time and they're incredibly strong. Uh, using something like chain, it's really difficult to get chain to go through uh, pulleys that have to go up there and then across to the top and then up to the winch at the top there. Um, so chain's out. And then using something like, like Dyneema, that's possible, um, but there's some question marks on Dyneema that I have. I don't know how it would stand up to uh, constant UV and I don't know how it would stand up to being submerged in salt water for months at a time. So hence I've gone with bargain basement galvanised chain that's going to be greased because that's just what every fisherman in the world would pretty much use and it's it's just a really well known sort of method. This is plate ready, the plate's ready to go in, it's fitted and everything. Dame's going to do that welding this afternoon. We're putting um, plastic in here, uh, so Dame's got to attach those uh, so that there's less friction, less noise. <laughs> They're squealing, they're very loud when they go up and down. 
<laughs> I love my handrail, <laughs> my vertical handrail. It's brilliant. Um, so just so you know, if you can just look straight down there, you can see how big the holes are for the pins. It holds the, the arm solid. It's not going to go anywhere when it's down, and when it's up, it's, it's attached. You can see there's a couple of little flats that have been welded there as stairs. This is so we can move up and down them so we're, while we're working on them. We're actually going to do bent bar and make some lovely handrails that um, double as steps. You can pull yourself up when you're, they're down, if you're diving, if you're going for a swim. Uh, so we can walk up and down the arms. A common question we get is why not put a lifting point right in the middle of the arm and pull directly from the centre here? And there's a really simple reason for that. It's all about physics. If you're up the top of the sliders where we are now and you imagine pulling directly from the top of the arm, vertical, that wing will come in and it'll come in about 80%. When it gets to about 80%, then it becomes almost impossible to lift from the top because the arm physically doesn't move up and down on the sliders very much when you're doing that last sort of 10 or 20% of wing coming in or out. Now that's why we're looking at doing it from the pulley on the wing itself using the big steel cables that we've got that come up to our wheelhouse winches because as that wing comes in, the cable is pulling 90 degrees to the direction of travel all the time. So you're able to basically use the winch and lock the wing in not really, really hard into the side of the boat. You don't have to do any secondary movements like get out and put levers on or do anything like that. Nothing dangerous outside the boat. You can do everything from the push of a switch. If we were to do it from the top of the arm, we'd be able to bring the wing up to about, say, 80%, and then we'd have to physically, we wouldn't be able to put enough force on it. It would be infinite amount of force needed because you've only got about quarter inch movement on top of the arm to do the last sort of 10 or 20% of, of wing coming in. You'd have to have a secondary mechanism. So it could be like um, a lever or it could be sort of another set of pulleys or blocks or something to pull it in. So by pulling on the wing, it's a much more safe way of doing it, and it's also a heck of a lot more rigid. While we're here, these things. Oh yeah. A little bit of discussion about our, our, our winches, yes. which should have worked. Yeah, so there's, there's a few conversations going on in the comments. One is they need to be replaced with hydraulics um, and get rid of the electrics. You're absolutely right, they need to be replaced with hydraulics and we need to get rid of the electrics. However, we're coming up against the same challenge that we had a year ago when we put these on. To do hydraulics, it's looking like it's going to be about five to six thousand dollars for us because we need either two winches, one for each wing, um, or two rams and a whole bunch of pulleys and blocks and things, one for each wing, um, and a hydraulic power pack to run everything. All up, that's about $6,000 worth of gear. Um, so that's a huge cost impetus for a project that runs on a shoestring. These winches were 500 bucks each. Now, admittedly, they are cheap. They're not great quality, as evidenced by this. Um, however, there's theoretically no reason why this solution couldn't work and an electric winch couldn't work. It's, it's normal to have electrics out in, out in the open, Think about radar, it's always electric. It's most yachts have an electric anchor winch. Not open like this, of course. That's Slightly more waterproof than this. A little <laughs> bit more. cap would be on and it would be. A little bit more sicker on the maybe. down. <laughs> so, but we were also going to build boxes to protect yeah. them a bit, weren't we? The plan was like a stainless box over the whole thing to protect it. However, if these can't handle rain and a little bit of yard dust, there's no way they're going to handle sea air inside a stainless box. So these winches are garbage. I get that. Um, however, it's a, it's a cost thing basically. Running hydraulics to the roof on the wheelhouse is expensive, difficult, you know, there's issues if anything fails. Electrics are really simple, it's just cables up here, it's no big deal. We've got enough electricity on the boat to run these sorts of things, but it's more a case of can we find something that's strong enough to do the job. Um, these are 5,000 pound winches and the load on this cable is very, very little. The load on this cable is less than 200 kgs, so got no idea what that is in American units. Um, Electric is a simple solution, but I'm struggling to find a winch that's up to the job. Um, hydraulic is, is absolutely the best option and would be the right thing to do if you were setting this boat up as a, like a commercial fisherman or something like that. But it's an incredibly expensive um, solution for us and one that we're really struggling to kind of finance because it's, it's a huge cost impetus right before we try to launch. That's why we went uh, electric in the early days um, and that's why we're struggling to make the decision to go to hydraulic now, mainly because of the cost. But. These right now are turning into our manual winches. <laughs> you know, drill on there, fine. So we can pull these arms up and down, which is, but we were thinking of a, a yacht winch and there are a few suggestions in the comments, thanks guys, for a yacht winch, similar sort of thing. It's just, it's just something to lift them up and down that we can. I'd like to go to a proper um, manual yacht winch eventually. Um, for now, this will do. Uh, whether we go hydraulic land, <laughs> 
Where do we go? Where do we go? Hydraulic rams, Adrian. <laughs> Thanks for the suggestion. Uh, or um, hydraulic winches on the side of the boat, something like that. Uh, we're just we're just coming to terms uh, and facing the facts that we have to. <laughs> <laughs> we're just, we have to, so we'll find a way, uh, we'll keep you updated. But thanks for your suggestions guys and we hope that clears up a few queries. For those who don't know Brewpig very well, uh, we, are, we are a dark boat but the decks are actually painted a light colour to reflect the heat. I suppose an overall question, why do stabilisers on a boat like this? So yachts don't necessarily need stabilisers, they've got sails and they've got a keel and if you say you're in a couple of knots of breeze you can put the mainsail up and it'll act like a stabiliser, it just holds a wee bit of pressure and the boat doesn't rock and roll too much when you, um, you know, the motion against the hull. Motorboats are different, they don't have anything like that, they've got a slightly higher centre of gravity, they generally don't have a keel or um, you know, anything low down like that and they don't have sails that are going to dampen any rolling effect so they do roll around a lot more than say a, a normal average sailboat. Um, like that one. Like that one. Keel. Sail. Well, rig with a sail. Back to you. <laughs> Back to you. <laughs> Live from the studio. <laughs> so having having stabilizers on a motorboat is um, quite common. Having them on fishing boats, they normally they have great big arms on fishing boats to haul nets, and then it's common for them just to drop paravanes off the end of those because they've already got 90% of the gear they need. They just put a you know, couple of pulleys out and it's done. Um, we don't have any of those arms. We wanted to, when they fold up, they're very tall. We wanted to keep the boat as low as possible. So having stabiliser wings like we have is um, probably the best possible option that we could do um, given everything, uh, all of our variables and things like that. And it's going to keep the motion of the boat nice and stable. Now the difference between having stabilisers that are too effective versus not enough, if you've got them too effective, the boat stays too flat and waves will literally roll over the boat. If you've got them not effective enough, the boat will lurch and carry on. It's a really uncomfortable motion at sea. So there is a fine balance and that's why the last third of the wings is able to be cut off so that we can fine tune. If they're too big, we'll just trim some off and basically make them less effective so the motion um, becomes a bit more sort of easy and normal. This morning's job, I gave Stuart a bit of a hand on the side and we ripped all the paint off, which was nice. Now we're going to focus on that rim around the back end of the board, bringing it up each side 1.7 metres. So we're going to turn it into a stainless board. We have to upgrade the feed pump for our main anchor winch. Yeah, yeah, I think that's an absolute given. Yeah. You can't be swapping. Yeah. No. Um, which means you've decided that it's going to be hydraulic, whether it's a winch or a ram. It's definitely going to be hydraulic. I think so because that's what the commercial guys would do. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't even entertain the idea of electric. Mm -hmm. So what are the choices here? We do. I think we're settled on hydraulic over electric. Mm -hmm. And the options are basically um, a version of a ram or a version using a hydraulic winch. The right. trouble with the roof is you've got to. You just described to you this morning how many voltage you need to go through. Yeah to get hydraulics onto the roof. A minimum of three bulkheads, so that means every bulkhead has two fittings, so that means six possible points of leakage mm. to get a hydraulic line to the roof. Oh, that's a lot. And you've got to do two hydraulic lines. So Unless you had a remote start power pack on the roof. So all you do is have air cooled. Little thing. Air cooled, yeah, maybe make it like your generator, make it diesel rather than petrol. Yeah. Goes in a box. Yeah, right. And all it does is have the only thing bolted to it, like like yours is diesel engine with a generator attached. The trouble is though, is that then you have to maintain a diesel engine. Well, so what? What's the, best, what's the best idea? So so we are my head that is getting a hydraulic winch, sinking it into the hull, and having a either a two to one or a one to one directly connected to the wing, and then having a hydraulic feed pump powered somehow. I haven't solved that bit yet, but powered somehow because we'll use it for the anchor winch as well as the wings. It won't be powerful enough to run something like a bow thruster, but it'll be powerful enough to run all of our winches. Oh my god, that was so good. Now we get the perfect mouthful. Mm. <laughs> I figure if we just start with this side here, mm -hmm. just template that up. Um, basically just needs to sort of weld so into there. So it's going yeah. Yeah, weld into there like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then just, because there's no lip or anything, so you can just go straight to this corner. Mm -hmm. So. I was just going to do something like that, and we just have to get rid of that. We have to drop it right down. Uh, yeah. See what I yeah. mean? Yep, I do. So can I give you that one? Sure. The scissors there to go. Um, right. I'm going to make a start on getting this bit trimmed up with a grinder. Sure. Now that Stu's got 
the template marked out, we've got a basic shape to cut. And he's got, this is the beauty of templates. You can sort of see he's got these little weird shapes and stuff at the bottom there. And by doing it out of cardboard, it's a piece of cake to get that shape and then transfer it directly onto the steel. Whilst Stu's doing that, up on the wing, up here, I've got this plate. You can see here, we've got a weld line running along there, but this is actually a slight difference in angle between this plate and this plate. So I've cut through about maybe 90% through this plate here and actually just bent it in. And then we'll get dogs and we'll get this to line up. So this and this will match that and that. Um, and we've tapered it off to nothing at this end and we'll just blend the whole lot in where we weld it. Normally we'd use our nine inch grinder for a lot of this cutting, but 60% of the cutting disc on this is no good. So we tried obviously undoing it. There's a reason it's sitting in the vise. We tried undoing it and we just could not get the damn thing loose. Um, it fell off something, hence this is broken. It fell off something. And um, when it landed, whatever happened, this here tightened with the force that Luke used in all of those popular TV shows. So I don't know, about 80 foot pound or something like that. Is that fitting? Well, the the forelock sort of does a bit of a curve. Yeah. Um, we'll be able to dog a lot of that out. Yeah. Yeah, it fits. Cool. It's a, it's definitely a fiddly one. Yeah. We'll just we'll we'll tack each corner and basically bend it with levers and stuff. Yeah, and then just a little. This little bottom thing might need filling up somehow. That's okay. I could do that with Mig. Based on the fact we're getting about 30 knots across the boat, we're going to be flux core MIG today. Crikey, we're getting a bit low on that. <laughs> okay, we're going to start off flux core MIG and then we might be progressing to stick when we run out of wire. I'm giving up trying to record voice audio because it is like 25 or 30 knots up the top, maybe 15 we were trying to weld. On the port side of the boat we need to get in and fix this big gaping hole so this is a piece of steel we hacked out a while back just to allow this cable assembly to run down to the wing and back and not bind up we need to cut around this radius um, edge you can see here make a piece of plate that'll fit in there and just um, weld all the way around that rim once we've got that plate in and then we're going to cut a stainless um, entrance to allow those cables to just basically come out and not bind up we also need to clean this up this was just hacked out with a five inch grinder we need to do a nice radius corner um, on both sides just to make it a nice lovely piece where we get our arm out if needed and we'll make some bolt-in caps for those.
We're nearly there. The plan now is to template up these gaps, make some steel, and weld them in. There's two main methods we use when we're cutting out our steel. If we've got a complex shape like an oval, in this case, we use the plasma cutter, we template them up, and then gently run the plasma around, and that allows us to get any weird undulations in the shape out into the steel that we need. And we just find when the plasma is set up right, it's 10 times faster to do it this way than to try and replicate this with a grinder. The other method that we use quite commonly is with a grinder. If we've got a square or a long flat straight to do, we'll use a cutoff disc because we end up with a really beautiful edge and there's no further work to do on that ready to weld. Once we're happy the piece of steel is going to fit the gap, it's time to clean up the edges like you can see here with a grinder so that we're ready to weld. For those that are not familiar with our bender, this is something I made a while ago. It's a piece of um, just a bit of scrap steel, 150mm across in this dimension, 32mm uh, solid mild steel pin. I've got a bit of 16mm uh, steel welded onto this slab here, and then under all of that I've got a piece of 50 by 50 box section just weld so I could clamp it in the vise and it holds on nice and tight. Now what I can do, take a piece of solid 16mm stainless, you sort of see it's quite chunky, we lock that in there and then we get this piece here which is our actual bender itself. So this part slides onto the 32mm uh, mild steel pin and then this part here does the work and actually wraps around, wraps this piece of metal around the pin and back out that way. So we can get a 32mm ID and we can create links of chain or we can create long lengths. Um, this is what we're using to allow the, uh, the cable to go out the side of the boat so that it never touches mild steel and it always hits stainless. You can see there, it gives you a really nice crisp bend, no um, you know, def deformation of the metal or anything like that. Yeah, that's how we get all of our um, openings in the hull, made with 16mm solid stainless bar. With our plates and parts now made, it was time to start tacking everything into the respective areas on the boat. So you work your way around the perimeter, just get everything to line up, you don't need to do a solid weld at this point. And if you've got a tricky spot like this, you can weld in what's called a dog, so it's a piece of steel that gets welded to the boat itself or to one of the plates that you're trying to align and then you get a wedge just like this and you put it in the little slot that's cut into that steel and as you hit it it overlaps both pieces of steel so as you hit it it basically pulls it up flush and there's no way that you can go over flush it's an awesome little tool for lining up steel that has to have a little bend put into it just to make sure that it works once everything's tacked together you can start going around with your uh, full cap welds in this case we're doing vertical up around these panels mainly because we want them to be as strong as possible and we can always do a bit of a grind to clean up the surface weld once we're finished. Now that we've got the plates welded in we can get our stainless hoop that we made and start sizing that so easiest way to do that is just put it on the outside draw around it and start cutting with the plasma cutter it might take a couple of goes sometimes to get this to fit but it's a really simple method of putting a weird shape into a flat piece of steel Yeah. 
Now that we've got the plates welded in, we want to go through and sandblast it. When I say welded, it's basically tacked, we're not fully finished with the welding yet. By sandblasting out like this, we can just get into all the little nooks and crannies and joins and that sort of thing on the plate. When we're welding, we now know that we're going to be welding with perfectly clean steel. So we're using straight argon and 309 wire and this joins mild steel to stainless really well. We're doing a vertical up on this one side so we've got a really strong join on that one side on the outside and that's enough to hold the whole thing in, there's no way that's going anywhere. However, on this other side we're actually going to do a vertical down. So getting a nice looking weld is much easier with a vertical down than it is with a vertical up but it's nowhere near as strong. So if you're just doing something that has to look good, vertical down is a great weld for that. Now that we've finished the stainless welding, we're back onto mild steel only. So we're using a flux core wire with an argon and oxygen gas mix. And we're just filling in all of the welds that were sandblasted yesterday. Now that we've got really clean, easy steel to weld, we just vertical up everything that needs to be nice and strong. Down the moon 